part of the um, impetus, I want to thank um, Jenny and Kurt and everyone else for the invitation to, to speak here. As you probably know, they're part of a, a large national focus on climate change and animal agriculture. And part of the reason for this uh, presentation is it gives me an opportunity to update one that I presented two years ago at the first Waste to Work conference held in Denver. And this was the slide, sort of, the picture I used at the end of that presentation talking about carbon markets and, and um, carbon credits. Uh, it's the cherry on top. It's that little bit of extra income that uh, helps a, a project get started, maybe. It's that little extra 5% uh, revenue that maybe makes the difference in helping to get a project underway. So I wanted to start with that and then bring you up to speed on a lot of what I discussed in that presentation and introduce some, some of the new topics. Greenhouse gas reductions have value. Uh, as um, in many cases, you can see there are markets developed for all kinds of environmental uh, values, the ecosystem service market uh, space. Uh, conservation reserve program is like that. It provides an economic benefit to a producer, uh, in, a crop producer in particular, for uh, conserving. Uh, there are renewable energy credits. Uh, the original cap and trade markets were about controlling uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide pollution uh, from the uh, power industry. There are water and nutrient trading systems, as, as producers around here are familiar with the Chesapeake Bay. And, uh, and then carbon credits from greenhouse gas reductions or avoidance, sequestration, those kinds of things. And I'd like to uh, speak in, in this presentation about four particular ways that uh, digesters and dairy producers have been able to capture value from their carbon reductions. Uh, the key greenhouse gases that have been discussed, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and, and some of the others. So the first way that people have been able to capture value is through a utility-based program. Not strictly a carbon market, a carbon credit market, but through utility-based um, uh, partnerships, if you will. So the green power, green gas collections, they, they take money in from their customers that want to purchase green or renewable fuels or, or power, and then they provide that money back through standard offer contracts or feed-in tariffs or even direct subsidies to producers. There are examples of this in Vermont. Uh, North Carolina had one that, that really focused in on swine and swine production and, and producing green power from swine operations. Washington State has a small program. Vermont is, is probably one of the, the great ones to look at if you're looking for a model of this kind of program. They have their speed and, and now with the legislature this year it's, it's become reset where they're providing direct subsidies for all kinds of renewable energy but uh, the focus on farm methane. They provide long term, long term 20 year standard contracts to support renewable power. And the current offering for digesters is uh, 14 cents a kilowatt hour, 14 and a half if you're over 150 kW, but if you're a smaller operation, that almost gets to 20 cents a kWh. So that's a really nice program to provide the kind of income that is needed. And then that's supplemented by the Vermont's Cow Power Program, which started in 2004. It collects uh, from the voluntary customer that chooses to support this program and collects four cents. They now have 12 dairy digesters and then that four cents goes directly to the, the cow power participating dairy. It includes all the carbon dioxide and methane reduction benefits so it's got that carbon link or it's got that greenhouse gas link to it. Um, it now provides um, through this program electricity for about 3,000 homes and uh, it has reported in the past three and a half million dollars paid to participating farmers, so among those 12 dairy digesters. There was a kind of a similar program that uh, developed in British Columbia 
uh, over the, the last few years. Um, utility there, BC Hydro paid 10 cents a kilowatt hour, but they found through their research that it actually costs uh, the dairy about 14 cents to make that project happen. So Cal Power enlisted businesses and individual customers to pay that extra four, per, four cents and then they uh, gave that money to the digester projects. Lasted for a while, unfortunately that program is now closed. Um, it, it just, there wasn't enough inertia behind it to keep it going. I'd like to shift now to the, the next two ways that folks uh, make money in carbon, uh, through the voluntary carbon market and then the compliance carbon market. Of course, voluntary is just that. It's a voluntary system where, again, you get customers that want to pay more for green power or green fuel or renewable or um, to reduce greenhouse gases. It's sometimes a business-to-business -business transaction, but they do actually look to create a carbon credit, a standardized credit. So that's where it's maybe different from the utility-based program, which is just sort of based on kilowatt hours of production. This is actually uh, creating carbon credits and then selling those voluntarily. The compliance market is just what that says. These are markets where you are required now as a, uh, some entity, uh, utility or, or some other entity in, in California. It's if you're 25,000 uh, metric tons of greenhouse gas production a year then you're a, um, an entity that's regulated to reduce greenhouse gases. There's an overall cap on emissions, which gets smaller over time. So that's how the program ensures reductions of, of carbon dioxide or, or greenhouse gases. There's an allowance system or a permit. Basically, these covered entities are required to buy permits to put that pollution in the atmosphere now. And then they can use these permits or uh, the programs typically provide for a voluntary offset program as part of this, and uh, we'll just get into more details here shortly. So just to be on the same page with everybody, the carbon offset credit, these are uh, documented, verified results of reductions of greenhouse gases or um, increases in carbon sequestration for, for some programs. Carbon dioxide is the measurement uh, that's used uh, pretty standard wide. Uh, a metric ton of CO2 is one carbon credit. Uh, global warming potential is relative. Again, uh, it's been mentioned before, methane is a uh, more potent greenhouse gas. So in this case, it's usually 21 or 23 times uh, the amount of carbon credits that you get for a ton of methane versus a, a ton of CO2. And then uh, it, it can be complex, let's face it. There are specific criteria that have to be met. Um, additionality is one of them. So um, these have to be a, a voluntary choice that's made. It's not something that is regulated. So if you're required to reduce your greenhouse gases and then you put in a system to do that, you don't get carbon credits for that. You're required to do that. So this has to be above and beyond what you are required by someone to do. Um, there are some timing tests often, so it has to be, you have to get your registration in at a particular time after starting the project. Uh, there's typically time limits for how, you, how long you can create credits. There also have to be, um, you have to meet tests for permanence, uh, so that these are permanent reductions. It's not just something that's temporarily reduced. Uh, they have to be measurable and verifiable, have clear ownership. All of these are some of the, the strictures around the market. This is the basic system. You, you create a baseline for a farm, so it's the open lagoon that's spewing out methane from all this manure that's being stored in anaerobic conditions. And that provides the baseline against which you can uh, create carbon credits. So when you cover that lagoon and flare the gas or you put in a digester and, and capture the methane gas and now use it productively for heat or, or power, you measure against that baseline of what you were producing earlier and now you've brought it down, that baseline, if you can reduce it completely, is 
gives you a sense of how many carbon credits you can create in the marketplace. And these are some of the different steps involved, creating boundaries around the project, measuring, monitoring, and verification are, are key ones, certification, sometimes credits get aggregated. If it's a small project, you can make a, a bigger amount of credits, some of the things involved in the market. I want to introduce or talk about three of uh, some of the players in the voluntary market. So the, the Climate Trust out in Oregon has been around. They got started uh, with an Oregon project that was going to install new, uh, a, a utility that was going to create a new power plant. Uh, the Oregon State required them to offset the added greenhouse gases coming from that power plant. So they created this nonprofit with a $5 million trust to start with. The Climate Trust has continued to operate in that space. They continue to, to bring in uh, resources and then provide um, a mechanism for people to generate carbon credits and then market them out to uh, the industry. So they have provided a lot of support for policy and, and protocol development. They manage these dedicated offset funds and they work in a lot of different areas. Another one that maybe you've heard of is uh, Native Energy, uh, which since 2000 has been uh, developing carbon credits around uh, wind and ag methane. They do carbon offsets. They also do renewable energy credits, uh, provide carbon accounting software. And one of their uh, differences, secret sauce maybe, is that they're willing to take some of the risk along with the producer and provide funds up front. So they will prepay for carbon credits from a project that is under construction or being developed. And um, they, they get the added benefit of getting uh, the, the credits as that project moves forward 10 or 20 years down the road. And they have a lot of, they're proud of a lot of their corporate buyers. Another one, TerraPass, got started in 2004. There was a lot of activity in the mid-aughts, believe me. Um, they buy and sell offset credits, manage offset projects. Again, the, the clients are individuals, families. If you wanted to offset the, co the climate cost of getting to this meeting, you can go to TerraPass and buy some credits to offset the, the greenhouse gases of your life or of your plane trip. Um, just to give you a sense of price right now, about um, six bucks for a thousand pounds of, of CO2 equivalent. And there's um, the voluntary market um, continues today. Um, it's maybe a little stagnant. Uh, there have been some, um, it's still got a lot of the original corporate players that got involved 10 years ago. They continue to operate but there haven't been a lot of new corporate players into this market. Um, also, the, the, the level of new carbon credits hasn't been as great in this market. So some of the vintages that you would buy are some older vintages of credits. Um, each credit is tagged by the year that it was produced. So there needs to be or could be a little more uh, oomph brought into this particular marketplace. The compliance carbon market is really where a lot of the action is right now. Uh, so there are two major markets in the United States, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast, uh, nine different states participating, where they require the electricity sector to reduce credits. They're the complied or the regulated party, the entity in this case. Um, the allowances are auctioned. There's not a lot of space here for offset production. And currently, allowances are running about $5.50 per ton. California is uh, another market it got going in 2013. It includes the power and industrial sectors. And this year, they're bringing on the transportation sector. Um, again, allowances are auctioned. That's the permits to pollute. To pollute. But they have a minimum floor price of $10, which ratch ratchets up over time. They do offsets, uh, and they have a pretty um, good offset program. Uh, an entity can, can use offsets for about 8% of its compliance obligation. And they've got six different areas now, and livestock methane is one of uh, a key area. Currently, their allowances are running about 1250 
in this market. This chart is here to provide you some idea of the potential uh, offset demand, 26 million tons of, of carbon offsets uh, in this first um, scoping period. The next period could go up as much as 91 million. California works with a couple of offset reserves. These are other entities that do the part of um, bringing in the information of, of um, working with the California Air Resources Board, which is in charge of the marketplace. They work with the Climate Action Reserve and um, the American Climate Registry to get the projects created, to get them registered, to do the verification, to manage all that process. So the Climate Action Reserve um, was an early actor. They've got um, a bunch of projects they verified 2 million credits. So they had some early action projects that were sort of in the voluntary system. Now they've got their compliance projects. Projects that were in early had to move over to the compliance project list. They now have 17 active projects and are starting to verify an increasing number of credits. The American Carbon Registry has 11 methane projects. Nine of them are compliance projects and they're uh, starting to verify credits in this market. Again, this is the um, auction price. It's now $12.73. It's, it's been hovering around that $12, $13 mark uh, for the last year. And the message I'm hearing from people is that the offset prices are discounted about 10%, 5 to 10% off the allowance price. So you're going to get a little bit less for your offset project than you would from this allowance price. So updating this chart that was uh, presented a couple of years ago, it hasn't changed a lot. Uh, looking at the compliance value, uh, about two to three credits per cow, roughly, and uh, Patrick's going to help me uh, uh, get that a little clearer. Initial equipment costs can be quite high for a project. This adds some cost in terms of measuring and monitoring methane flows from a digester that if you're not in this market you don't have to do that. So there are some added costs. Um, the measuring, monitoring, the verification costs can be quite high. You also potentially have a, a partner or a transaction cost to actually get those credits sold on a marketplace. And again, the offset value is lagging allowance prices. So what it ends up being is that there's about a 1,500 cow equivalent threshold market for um, having a project that's large enough to afford these costs and still benefit economically from this market. Now a whole new way that's just developed in the last couple of years for getting value from carbon in this area are the low carbon fuel standards. Uh, the low carbon fuel standard requires fuel providers, refineries and other uh, companies that provide fuel in a state or an area, to reduce the carbon in intensity of their transportation fuels by 10%. This is the California standard. They must reduce the carbon intensity by 10% by 2020. Carbon intensities are established through life cycle assessments. And this sort of mixes the command control and market-based policy methods that are available to, to policy wonks. Right now, it's California and Oregon that have an LCFS. But you can see the carbon intensity values established here, um, 99 uh, is grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule for gasoline, compressed natural gas is less, Dairy biogas is way down there because you're getting some of this benefit. But right now, that measure, as I understand, was only calculated against the CO2 value. If you add in the methane value, the reduction of methane, you actually get more closer to that negative value that they finally calculated for food waste scraps. So if you're digesting food waste, keeping it out of landfills, you're reducing the methane that is driven off in the landfill, plus you've got a low carbon dioxide fuel, you're way down there. You, you can generate credits from this difference in the carbon intensity value. And those LCFS prices, 
went way high at one point. And again, this is for a metric ton of CO2 equivalent, so way higher than what the carbon markets were. They're now down to you know twenty, thirty dollars, and you don't get the 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 way that credits are calculated. Again, it's based on the carbon intensity of the fuel, but also on um, how much carbon reduction is required in the state for any one year. So there's a difference in how the credits are generated between the markets, but still um, you're getting good credits from this kind of market and the, the prices are much higher and as important or more important, the transaction costs in this marketplace are much lower than in the carbon market system. So in the carbon market in California, you have registration costs, you have to get into the system, you have to hire a company every year to come out and do a complete verification. Those do not exist right now in this LCFS market. So that the ease of entry is much uh, better here in this system. So lots of market risks. Um, a lot of it's about complexity, timing, uh, monitoring systems, making sure that your meters are always functioning to keep track, um, ver verification, um, the buyers are a risk. There's lots of risks here. Uh, that should be mentioned. Just a kind of a quick summary of where projects could fall in terms of participating in the utility market or voluntary. The compliance market is going to tend to favor those larger projects. Total value, uh, there was a USDA report on digesters that estimated that a, a carbon price of 13 metric uh, dollars a metric ton uh, could get more than half the dairy operations of more than 500 cows could get more profitable. And then uh, if you got to 26, you're almost 70% could become more profitable. There are some great goals. Um, with these last slides, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about how the industry might respond to this. Now, these next slides, I'm not putting these up because I believe this is true. But I'm putting these up because a lot of fingers are being pointed at the dairy industry. Oh, your cows are worse than coal when it comes to greenhouse gases. Or they're worse than cars for the amount of pollution that's going up in the atmosphere. Well, Allison showed you some of the, the greenhouse gases. There are direct emissions uh, from methane. There are indirect emissions at the bottom there from using electricity and those other things on the farm and fuel. Uh, so there are um, emissions here, uh, represents 7, 8, 9 percent of what's total in this country. And as you can see, there's from soil management and enteric fermentation quite a bit more. But a lot of fingers are getting pointed at manure management. And methane, as, as Allison mentioned, it's a short term. So over a 100 year time span, it's 21 times greater global warming potential. But in the short term, it's more like 85 times in the 50 year time span. So managing methane, and one way to do that, because all the policy makers have is they're either going to regulate or they can create these market-based systems. And when the national carbon market failed in 2010 and there was no national cap and trade. The way the government's gone is it's gone toward the regulatory approach because that's what they're left with. So I would um, just put it out there uh, uh, for something the industry can consider is that um, while currently the regulations are falling on power plants, the idea that you would start to look at low-hanging fruit like methane coming off of lagoons is not beyond the realm of possibility. And um, just the thought that the industry may want to get behind some of these market-based approaches as a way to um, positively impact the, the whole situation. Thank you all.